Forces, Part 2. Here are your priming questions. Forces, Part 2. This presentation will help you to understand forces by combining the second and the third laws. So as a quick example, if we have a baseball player swing the bat at the ball, the force that is applied by the bat to the ball is the same as the force that the ball applies to the bat. We know this because of Newton's third law, which says that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. So in this particular case, it is impossible for the bat to apply more force to the ball, or alternately for the ball to apply more force to the bat, as long as neither deform. So if it broke the bat, or if we destroyed the ball, things would be different. But in this case, let's say that the bat stays in one piece, the ball stays in one piece, and so we know that the force on both is going to be the same. And we know that F is equal to MA, and let's say that this is going to be the mass of the for one, we'll say the, the mass and acceleration of the bat, and we'll say F is equal to MA, and two will be of the ball. We know that these forces, these two Fs, are the same, and so we can say, we can equal these together. So we have M1, A1 is equal to M2, A2. And so you might be wondering, how does this work? Because the accelerations are so different when someone hits a, a ball. And the reason for this is because of the masses. The masses are so different here that the accelerations are also different. The way we can think about this is as a relationship between variables. If the force remains the constant, if we were to increase the mass, that means that the acceleration must decrease. This is what we call an inverse relationship. As one increases, the other decreases. All right, we can talk about this as another example. If we look at this, we have a car and we have all these insects that have hit the windshield of it. And if we think about it, which applied the most force, the insect or the car? It's actually the same. And so the force that the insect applied to the car is exactly the same force that the car applied to the insect. The reason why you don't feel it when an insect hits your car is because of the increase or the change or the difference in the mass of the car compared to the mass of the insect. And so the car with you in it will have a much smaller acceleration because of the large mass and the insect will have a very large acceleration because of such a small mass. Now, for forces, you want to become very familiar with how to draw what we call free body diagrams or FBDs. And they simply represent whatever object or objects you're looking at and we draw vectors, these arrows, of forces going in whatever direction the force is applied. So if we look at this first example, we have a person on a sled, and what we always need to add first is the gravitational force, and this is going to be the force that is going downward. This is often called your weight. And so the gravitational force <coughs> will be going down, and if you are on a sled and you are on the ground, you are not accelerating into the ground or into the earth, to the center of the earth, the ground is pushing back up on you. And that force of the surface pushing up on you is what we call the normal force. And if you are not accelerating up or accelerating down, we can say that our gravitational force and the normal force in this case are equal. So we'll just say for this example that the gravitational force and the normal force are both 20 newtons. If these forces were different, then this object, or you, would be accelerating in one direction or the other. But right now, since both of them are equal, we are in equilibrium. We're not accelerating in one direction or the other. We're standing still in this particular case. The main thing, though, is that we are not accelerating, which could mean that we're going at a constant velocity. But we'll talk more about that later. 
Here are some examples of uh, other free body diagrams. And you can see that they are all just boxes that you draw. And then as you read a problem, you start applying vectors onto it. And then from those vectors, you can figure out what the net force is. That's going to be the total force acting on it. Or in these cases, if you know the net force, you can find specific vectors. So if we look at this first one, if we're told for this free body diagram that we have a weight or gravitational vector of 200 newtons and we have an applied vector of 50 newtons to the right, yet our net force, our F net, is zero newtons, what that tells us is that we have opposing forces that equal the forces that we are already given. So if we have our gravitational force of 200 newtons here, we know that our normal force, if our net force is zero, we know that our normal force, B, is going to be equal to 200 newtons as well. And if we have a force applied 50 newtons to the right, and our net force is zero newtons, we also know that our A vector is also 50 newtons. For the next one, if we look at this, we only have two vectors now, and the first one is given to us. Our gravitational vector is 200 newtons, again. Yet we're told that our net force is 900 newtons up. This would be like a string or rope that is attached to you and pulling you up. And so if we know that we have 900 newtons net going up, that means that our C vector must be equal to 1100. Because in this case, this means that we need to have 1100 going up, we have 200 going down, we would subtract the two to get 900 newtons going up. So remember, this is the net force or the total. We can also think of it as the sum of the forces. Let's look at this one. For the next one, we have 300 newtons going up, we have 80 newtons going to the left, and we have an E and a D vector. We're told that we have a net force, but it is only 60 newtons going left, which means that we don't have a net force in the vertical, which tells us that our E vector is going to be equal to 300 newtons. That's going to be our weight. And if we know that our net force is 60 newtons to the left, we know that our D vector is going to be 20 newtons. Because if this is 20 newtons going to the right, we subtract that from the 80 newtons going to the left, that gives us a net or total of 60 newtons to the left. If we look at the last one here, we have 20 newtons going to the left, we have F, G, and H, and we are told that our net force is 30 newtons to the right. In this particular case, we don't know anything about the vertical. All we know in this case is that our F vector is equal to our H vector. We don't actually know the value, but for our G vector, if we know we have 20 newtons going to the left, and we know that our net force is 30 newtons to the right, we know that our g needs to be 30 newtons greater than our 20 newtons going to the left, which means that our g vector will be 50 newtons. For this last slide, I want to quickly show you some things, and this is going to take air resistance into account. But it is so that you can see the differences in the net force and the accelerations as the forces begin to equalize and as we change those things. So if we look at this parachuter, at first, there's only the gravitational force going down, and so it has a very high acceleration going down, and we'll wait for it to restart. As the air resistance increases, you can see that the acceleration decreases. And this is when things start to equalize out for the uh, parachuter. And that is when they are in uh, at their terminal velocity. And it feels like they are weightless. Once the parachuter opens up his parachute, what you'll notice is that the air resistance increases and the acceleration is actually pointed upwards. This is how the parachuter actually slows down. Because at the point that the parachute is open, the person is moving at a very fast velocity in the downward direction. The parachute slows the person down, 
by applying a force going up using air resistance so that the person is actually accelerated upwards which you can think of as a deceleration because the person was going downwards and this animation here on the left and on the right you can see two examples one on the left here is if there is no air resistance if there is no air resistance all objects will fall at the same rate doesn't matter the size the shape whether it's really wide or anything on the left side this is with no air resistance the only thing that matters is the acceleration due to gravity on the right side though if we take air resistance into account now and if we have a small object like a feather the air resistance will interfere if you if that makes sense or it will drag on the object and it will reach its terminal velocity very quickly and will just gradually come down so that is the difference between no air resistance and with air resistance in most of our cases, we're going to talk about situations with no air resistance because this one over here with air resistance, this makes things really complicated really quickly.